Good morning. Welcome to worship today. Those of you who are gathered here in the sanctuary and, and those of you who are joining us at home or as you travel, we welcome you today. We welcome you to this place where God has already come and, and meets us here. Today we begin a new worship series, a series on generosity. We're going to look at what that means, what that means to us as sons and daughters of Christ and how we live that out in expressions of love to God and to our neighbors. This morning is also a time where we will be celebrating Holy Communion. And so I would just uh, double check that you have the small individual uh, communion elements here. If you don't, we can have an usher bring one to you. You can just raise your hand. And if you're at home watching us live, we invite you to take a moment and gather whatever elements you have um, that you can partake with during this time of celebrating Holy Communion later in the service. So I invite you now to sit back, but don't get too comfortable. Stay on the edge of your seat, almost in anticipation of what God has to give to you today. And let our hearts be centered as the light is brought into the sanctuary. Would you please stand as you are able and join me in this morning's call to worship. Come now to worship God who is the very definition of generosity and all who calls each of us to become without hesitation or pressure, trusting that in our upside down life of the gospel, our wealth is measured, not by what we have, by not what we have, but what we give away. We give joyfully as an act of our trust in you, great God, to bless your church your people, and your creation through our giving.
with the beginning of our new series, we also have a new song, actually two new songs, we're going to be singing during Time with the Children. And so the choir is going to sing our first one, You Are All We Have. And I invite children to come join me here at the altar as we sing the opening song. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here this morning. We have something up here on, we have lots of somethings up here on the altar that we don't usually have. Anybody see a theme going on? Yes. Hats. Hats. I definitely see a strong hat theme. And there is even a very special hat, a nurse's hat that we don't see very often anymore. So I hope that people will have a chance to take a close look at the things. What about the other stuff besides the hats? Objects. Sewing machine. There's a hard hat. There are some work gloves. There's things you need for work. Things you need for work. Exactly. Job-wise, exactly. There's even a tiny little dress form, like for somebody making a tiny dress, they could pin fabric on there for a doll, exactly. So all sorts of things that remind us of the work that people do. And we are, this is a holiday weekend, so we don't, many of us don't have work or school on Monday as we celebrate Labor Day and we remember the people your parents, your grandparents, you, we remember the work of people and how it helps things to go well. And sometimes it's the work that we can't see, the cleaning and the organizing that gets done not on a Sunday morning, but it's so important. Jesus tells us some neat things about work and about how the people who love and follow Jesus work together to create a world that is more like the world we want to live in. And we're going to be talking about that this next month. I've got a piece of paper for everybody. You can take it if you want. Here you go, ma'am. Okay, now we're going to see if we can stack these. Can you help me? The idea is that we are going to try to get these pieces of paper to fit together. Do you think we can make it tall? I would like to see how tall we can make it with these pieces of paper. So can you interlock? Now this is a project that we're going to be working on this month. I have some new colors here. I have been loving the work you've created for our art wall. And so this is an invitation to start making some new kinds of art. You can see what's happening here. If you put these pieces together, I think we're going to be able to make it stand up on its own. But we'll, we'll work on that when we have a few more colored. Anyway, will you, will you make this colorful? Will you either where you're sitting this morning or over in the parade ground, Make these pieces really colorful, and you might draw something that reminds you of work and work that you like to do. So that is my thought for you today, and I am excited to see what you're going to come up with. And we'll just, I'm going to tell you about the song that we're going to hear as we leave this morning. So we've, we were listening to one kind of song every Sunday when we came and when we went. Now we're going to hear a new song 
And it talks about how important it is to do all the good we can, wherever we can do it. So that's a good song for Labor Day. And thank you for joining me. I'm going to say a quick prayer before you take your colors and go. Oh God, bless these children, bless their families, bless our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 3 verses 16 to 18 this is how we ought to know love Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters but if someone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but refuses to help how can the love of God dwell in a person like that Little children, let's not love with words or speech, but with action and truth.
the second chapter of James, verses 14 to 17. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith and do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one said to you, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit and inspire our hearts. If you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be wholly pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our world is in chaos. Fires out west, hurricanes in the south, flooding in the north and east, so much loss of life. The realities of climate change associated with most of it. There's the ruling over women's bodies in Texas, the turbulent withdrawal from Afghanistan and the recent condo collapse in Florida. Markets, though holding strong, have been fluctuating like the waxing and waning of the tides. The COVID-19 virus continues to wreak havoc with its deadly variants as loved ones fill up our hospitals and morgues again. There's grief and there's anger in a lot of places that we look. The weariness of our health care and emergency workers, along with our own prolonged fatigue in this pandemic, weighs at our hearts and pulls our hands into fists. If we're not careful, the darkness of hopelessness can shroud the light that we are called to bear. And I belong, I believe that we long to be hopeful. But it is hard to be hopeful when our hands are clenched in fits of rage or frustration or ringing with worry. It's hard to be hopeful when our hearts are heavy and full of sadness. I get that. I get that. And I struggle along with you. But I tell you this morning that there is always hope. And we are here, the church gathers here to encourage one another and to remind one another of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and to act on the challenge to exercise generosity in a single act of kindness each and every day. Back in January of this year, under, le under the leadership of Don Hinson, the Finance Committee was dis divided into two groups, a fundraising team to focus on events like the annual golf tournament, and a generosity team to continue the work of stewardship, the process of overseeing and managing all of the resources that are given to us. The generosity team met regularly and diligently studied Greg, 
Gibbs book, Creating a Culture of Generosity, a Field Guide for Church Leaders. And this book deeply resonated with us. Recognizing that words are powerful, we decided to rename the way we talk about stewardship by adopting this new word, generosity. Now, it's not a new word, of course, in and of itself. It's a word that has been around for a very long time. And it's a word that's also very rich in meaning. We're choosing the word generosity because we believe that generosity expresses the very heart of God. We also believe that this faith community engages in acts of generosity in many, many ways. And we want to expand on that. So it is our hope that the language of generosity becomes woven into the present and ongoing fabric of our mission and ministries here at West Heights United Methodist Church. Now, the actions of stewardship are important, so the concept of stewardship is not going away. Stewarding or caretaking of things that we have been entrusted to, to ensure that they are used in ways that they were meant to be used, is a critical biblical concept. An important practice and it's an important behavior of God's children. But stewardship has become one of those churchy kind of words that, that has restrictions built in and around it. Now, generally, our talk of stewardship in the church is predominantly budget talk. Receiving enough money in to take care of the expenses we have going out, like paying the staff and maintaining the building and, and taking other, care of other costs of ministry. And, and if we're fortunate, storing up a little bit extra for those rainy day times. In making this shift in the way we think about stewardship, we acknowledge that generosity is a mark of discipleship. That generosity is, in fact, a lifestyle. Generosity is about our behavior both within and outside the walls of this church. Generosity is the way that we think and utilize all of the resources that have been entrusted to us. Those that we can see and hold, as well as those that are part of our character and the skills and talents that we have. So as the hot days of summer lean into the warm and, and cooler nights of fall, we embark on this journey of hope through acts of generosity. And throughout this worship series, we will explore ways to practice generosity. And we begin today by looking at generosity as a mark of discipleship. Generosity in and of itself calls for open hands so that we are able to freely give to one another. Generosity holds the key of opening our heart's door to hope. And generosity is not something that we have to muster up all on our own, for it is inherent in us, inherent as our breath, because it is gifted to us by the one who created us. And the more we practice it, the more natural and regular it will come to us without even having to give it much thought. When generosity is practiced this way, becoming a characteristic trait and not an occasional or random event, it is evidenced in our life as a mark of discipleship 
meaning that others take notice of this pattern of behavior, this pattern of how we live out our lives, and then can then be directed to the one whom we follow. The mission of the church that Jesus established 2,000 years ago is anchored in his command to go and make disciples. Go into all the world and make disciples. And we call this the Great Commission. A disciple is one who follows. And as Christians, we follow Jesus the Christ, the anointed one sent from God, who was from the beginning, is now, and who forevermore shall be. God's generosity is evidenced most remarkably in Jesus' death. Jesus gave all, all of himself, in order that we might have life. This is why we believe that followers of Jesus engage in generous living. Discipleship then encompasses the actions we do to become more like Jesus. Sometimes discipleship is referred to as spiritual formation or Christian education or spiritual growth or perhaps being mentored in the faith. For us here at West Heights, discipleship is about growing people in their Christian faith so that they can know and follow the teachings of Jesus revealed through Scripture. And then witnessing to that faith so that others might come into this transforming relationship with Jesus as well. This is our work. This is how we are called to labor in God's kingdom. Gibb notes in his book that, <clears throat> excuse me, that at a very simple level, generosity describes the idea of being kind in the giving away of what one holds and does not solely refer to financial giving. For the Christian, it is rooted in our connection with a giving God who is the ultimate provider. This quintessential act of the generous God is the cornerstone of our Christian faith. That God loved us so much. That God became human in the person of Jesus, even knowing that that life would end in death, yet also knowing that that act would redeem us all and that that act of love would set us all free, free from the bondage to sin and death and give us life. This fundamental truth of our faith is what anchors us in the knowledge of God and is the absolute source of hope in Jesus Christ. No matter what happens, no matter what happens, this is the bedrock of our faith. And believing this, trusting this, is how we stay connected to God. We believe that generosity is the outgrowth of this connection with God. Generosity is the giving away of what came from God in the first place. As God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, so our posture toward God and toward others in response to God's love can be one of cheerful sacrifice and generosity. Listen up now. This can be true even in the midst of chaos even in the midst of uncertainty. 
Acts 20, 35 reminds us of Jesus' teaching. It is more blessed to give than to receive. This means that we truly can enjoy receiving, but that the blessings that we give, the blessings that we get when we give to others are even greater. God has a tendency to fill hands that are open. Open to freely receive and give in a never-ending role of being a conduit or a pipeline of God's mercy and grace in the world. God's goodness passes through us out to others. We live in a capitalistic economy, so, so money and the things that we buy with money are certainly part of our conversation, but generosity extends beyond the kindness we show when we share tangible things like money or building or, or clothing or food. Generosity speaks to the state of our spirits. And it is expressed in things like forgiveness and gentleness towards others. We can give the gift of generosity to ourselves by being kind to ourselves, by taking it easy on ourselves, by acknowledging our own fatigue or anger or frustration or grief and creating spaces where we can attend to those feelings that we have. Generosity by its own definition is a willingness to give help or support beyond what is usual or expected. When we give of ourselves this way, with such generous hearts to others and to our own self-care, then we can, as Paul writes to Timothy, take hold of the life that is truly life. Life that is fully grounded in and shaped by the person and presence of Jesus Christ in our lives is true life. When we live this way, when, when we live with this openness, we can live with open, unclenched hands that reveal this hope and love to others. So I invite you to live into this life that is truly life. To help build some uh, muscle memory, I, want you, uh, I invite you to, to join me in the challenge of being intentional in one act of generosity each day throughout this worship series. Now we're going to go for about a month and a half. So that's an opportunity for us to really focus and work on this habit of generosity. It could look like biting your tongue before you bite someone's head off, you know. Instead, uh, thinking about how what you say could actually build that person up. It could be creating time to sit with someone who is lonely. This is being generous with your time. It could be taking that nap or cu cutting something out of your calendar so that you can rest. This would be generous to yourself. And maybe you'd like to even start a generosity journal to record your acts. And over the next five weeks, we're going to look at ways that we can practice and experience generous living. And we're going to do that in the context of our five-fold membership vow, the membership vow that we take when we become members of local congregations in the United Methodist Church. 
as members individually, we vow to support the work of the church by our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And I hope you'll plan to join us as we explore each of these through the lens of generosity. And I pray that your hands will open. Will you pray with me now? Dear God, we come to you weary and heavy laden, seeking rest and renewal in your presence. For our service members killed in Afghanistan, may we never forget the service they gave, the gift of laying down their lives. For all lives that were lost in the storms and war fronts, may they receive new life in you and may their families know your peace that passes all understanding. For those recovering from the fury of flames and waves and wind, may they find comfort and strength in the arms of their communities. For those who are sick, may they find healing. Dear God, on this Labor Day Sunday, we give you thanks for all those who work to prevent and then recover from disasters. For those who work in stores and markets, in mines and fields, on ships and planes, in the armed forces, in factories and warehouses, in hospitals and churches, in offices and classrooms. God, we benefit from the labor of so many people, many of whom we never see. Thank you for their good work and faithful service. And thank you for our market economy that provides jobs and benefits to so many people. May our work always glorify you. Help us, O oh God, to live with open, unclenched hands as we reflect your generous life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For it is in his name we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, everybody. I'm Don Hansen, and today I want to share some thoughts about how we respond to God's blessings. And God has blessed me in so many ways. I was fortunate to be born and raised in Winfield, Kansas, part of a wonderful family, one of seven kids and great parents who uh, loved us in spite of all the stupid things we did. And growing up on a farm, I had the experience of milking cows, hauling hay, fixing fences, and working countless hours in the garden. And sometimes people say that they learn the value of hard work. I feel like I learned the value of not having to work that hard. Unfortunately, I was blessed with an interest in more uh, cerebral subjects like science, technology, and math. God blessed me with wonderful teachers dedicated who helped me to uh, make it through school, do well in school, and eventually I uh, earned an uh, engineering degree from Kansas State and later a computer science degree from Wichita State. Back in high school, uh, I started noticing this particular girl that was in my Algebra II class and my chemistry class. But of course, I was too shy to talk to her, or really any other girl for that matter. But after graduation, God blessed me with a friend who invited Marilyn to go on a double date with them. And on that day, we went and saw the movie Jaws on the day that it premiered. You could say we've been swimming with sharks together ever since, now with blessed with three kids and seven grandkids. But when we moved to Wichita in 1983, we found this church. And God has blessed us with the church family that has welcomed us and helped us to raise our kids and strengthen our faith. <clears throat> and raising our kids around so many kind and generous role models here at the church. 
Now the stated purpose of our church is to change lives by connecting hearts to Jesus Christ. And your life may be changed by something you experience today. It may be a particular prayer or, or a song that a musician plays or the choir sings that touches your heart or an idea from the sermon that inspires you some, or something you learn from Sunday school from your peers. And there have been many times during my life when this church has had that effect on me. One that comes to mind happened years ago. And at that time I was serving on the worship committee and we planned a service based on the passage from Micah 6. What does the Lord God ask of you but to love kindness, do justice, and walk humbly with your God? And when I attended the service, David Brottle was the preacher, and the way he addressed the subject really resonated with me, and it made me think, what if I loved kindness? What if I did justice, and what if I walked humbly with my God? And what if everyone did, how would the world be changed? Later on at work, <clears throat> I decided to change my logon password to include those initials, L-K-D-J-W-H, love kindness, do justice, walk humbly. And typing in that affirmation many, many times a day helped me to apply those ideas to my life. And although I didn't always live up to the highest standards, I took a step in the right direction. So to love kindness meant I had to be more generous with everyone generous with my time and talent and resources. And that's just one of the many ways that this church has changed my life and connected my heart. Now, during the month of September, we're going to be learning about generosity and we'll be asked to look at all the ways we support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our witness. And I want to be more generous in all of those areas. I believe that a generous person is a happier person and a happier person in turn is a more generous person. When we fill out our pledge cards this year, it will be an opportunity to become more generous supporters of our mission to change lives and connect hearts to Jesus Christ. So whether you decide to pledge for the first time or increase your pledge, it will be a step in the right direction. Finally, I want to leave you with this quote, God so loved the world that he gave Giving is at the top of his resume and should be at the top of ours. Thank you and God bless. Response, excuse me, in response to God's generosity and in response to Don's sharing, we pause to give thanks for the gifts that allow us to share generously financially and with our time and talents and our gifts, our prayers and our presence. And so we pause to give thanks to the God who is the giver of all gifts. Thank you, God, for your generosity toward us as we seek to follow you as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. table and all who love and serve and follow the Lord Jesus are welcome to come to this table. This table is open to all. We welcome you now to partake of communion. I want to remind you that if you don't have your own, like mine is still at the pew, to get it and to please remember that we open first the bottom and then the top. Let us join now together in the prayer of confession that will be here on the screens. Merciful God, forgive us, we pray, for all the times we have turned away from an opportunity to be generous. We believed in hopelessness, in isolation, or in despair more than we have believed in you. For all the times we have chosen timidity over bold witness, for all the times we have failed to live into the awesomeness of the gifts you have given us. Forgive us, O oh God, 
teach us how to forgive each other and help us to forgive ourselves. I invite us now into a moment of silent prayer. We offer our thoughts and prayers to the Lord and together we say, Amen. Receive this assurance of pardon. Lamentations 3, to 23 reminds us that God's steadfast love never ceases and God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. We are forgiven and free. Amen? Amen. This morning on this Labor Day Sunday, I was thinking about my father. He's still alive. He lives in the veterans' home in Winfield. But whenever I think about him, I think about how hard a worker he was. He didn't have a high school education, but he was a carpenter and he could build houses from the ground up, wiring, plumbing, you name it. He could look at a roof and just tell how many shingles it needed on it. Truly a remarkable man. As a little girl, I remember uh, my dad, and um, oftentimes he would go to work before I even got out of bed in the morning. And because a lot of his jobs were in remote places, building a new home or in construction of some kind, there were, really weren't uh, restaurants or cafes or even uh, lunch trucks around. And our family really didn't have the extra resources for him to eat out anyways, but he would carry a lunchbox, much like this one. Any of you have memories of this kind of a lunch pail? My mom would pack his lunch at night, and in the morning she'd perk a fresh pot of coffee and fill up his thermos. And he'd go off and he'd have his hot coffee for his morning break and probably a little bit left over if it was still warm for his lunch. I knew he always had a little snack in there because I'd watch mom make his lunch and then of course he'd have his main meal as well. And a lot of times I don't know if um, if he thought about it so much. But I'd like to think that when he had his lunch, it was a way that he remembered us, that he stayed connected to us during the day. And that the meal that he had helped to make him strong. And he was a strong man. And he would have his lunch and it would nourish him and it would give him the energy that he needed to continue doing the work that he was doing so that he could then provide, continue providing for his family. So as we gather at this table today, this table that has symbols of so many different kinds of work that we have done or do or want to do depending on our ages, we remember that we too need to be nourished. And so we come today ready to receive this meal that has been graciously provided for us. Fruit from the vine, Grain from the fields. And as we prepare to receive this meal, we remember the one who offers it to us. 
the one who on the night before he was betrayed took the cup and said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this and remember me. The one who took the bread and after offering a blessing on it, broke it and gave it to those who chose to follow him then and now and said, this is my body, broken for you, broken that you may know wholeness in your brokenness. Eat this as often as you do in remembrance of me. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be for us the, the body and blood of Christ. That you would transform us to be your hands and feet in the world. That you would make us to be your light of hope, your witnesses in our world. That you would lead us as we labor and work in your kingdom. This we pray, O oh God, that you would make us one, one with your Son, one with you, and one with one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. And so we take the bread for you, the bottom of your chalice there, We receive it, we give thanks. And then we take the cup poured out for all of us. May this token, this expression of the meal that we receive today magnify in us. May it fill our soul. May it renew us. May it move through our arms and into our hands that they might be open to give, to receive all that you would have for us and to pour through us to others. This we pray, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able for our hymn of sending forth, which is, My life is in you, Lord.
as we prepare for the light of Christ to go before us as we leave today, we pause for this benediction. As you have been fed at this table, go feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing that you have received from Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit be always with you. Amen.